to everyone get going. All right, so um, we are thrilled that so many new people are joining us tonight. Um, my name is Krista Dillabaugh and I'm the director of the Morpho Institute. And for those of you that are new to us, I'll, I'll just take a moment to introduce um, who we are. So we are a small nonprofit and we were founded by educators and we work with educators and our, our vision is a big one. Um, we have a vision of a intact Amazon um, that's, a, that's a treasured global resource for generations to come. And being educators, um, we are committed to harnessing education and educators to help make that happen. So our work revolves around providing professional development programs, which include professional development programs in the Amazon for US teachers. Many of our participants are on here tonight. So hi, everybody. Um, others are um, new to us and we, we by all means would love to have you join us. Um, but we offer professional development field programs. Um, we're excited to get back to the Amazon this summer after a two year hiatus due to COVID. But in addition to that, we host webinars like this one um, with Dr. Marie Trown. Um, she's on our faculty and I'll introduce her fully here in a minute. But um, we offer webinars throughout the year and we also develop curriculum in partnership with the educator team that we work with and our alumni network, um, all with the goal of achieving Amazon conservation. We work um, uh, totally in, in Northern Peru um, and we've had the great pleasure of getting to work with Marie Trone um, over the years while we've been down there. So um, if you'd like more information about the Morpho Institute, you can click on that little QR code or you can come visit us on our website, um, learn more about our field programs. Um, happy to take your donations. We're a small nonprofit and um, these are the donations that keep things like this happening. So Without further ado, I want to introduce the um, just irreplaceable and wonderful Dr. Marie Trone. She is a professor of biology at Valencia College, which is down in Florida. Um, she is um, a focusing on dolphins, um, particularly pink and gray dolphins that live in the Peruvian or all the Amazon rivers. Uh, her team that she works with utilizes ecology, animal behavior, computer science, and machine learning, electronic engineering in search of a way to identify the individual dolphins by their voices and assess their populations. Prior to COVID, Marie set up a permanent lab um, at, in the Amazon in conjunction and collaboration with one of our other partners, Amazon Explorama Lodges, so we're grateful for that. Um, and we're anxious to get her back down there and get her back into her research. She is part of the Morpho team, um, and when she is able to be in the field with us, she leads workshops and gets teachers out onto boats like this teaching them and, and um, introducing them to her research um, in a very hands-on, wonderful way. So when I say that she's always a big hit, um, you're gonna get to experience that tonight. So um, Marie, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn this over to you and um, welcome you to our very final installment of um, this school year of the, the conservation Amazon Conservation Through Education webinar series. So take it away, Marie. Okay, can you see my screen? You can. Awesome. So, okay, <laughs> this is uh, actually tonight. I know there's a couple of people, one of my colleagues that actually got me involved into all of this. It's kind of like his fault. Um, David Bonnet is online tonight. Um, so, the rest of you, if you have questions, you can also direct them at him. Um, and Brian Griffiths, I've seen he's on this. Um, tonight that I've seen, and I don't know who else is here. And if I'm missing you, I tried to scroll through everybody's names. But anyway, so these are the twisted mutant, they're pink, and they're dolphins that live in the river. They are the most undolphin dolphin that there is. And so this is just a little background information on them and kind of like what we're doing with them, what we're what our goal is, and just why they're so unique and weird. So a little bit about Ania, which is their genus name. And of course they do look a little weird. Um, first off, they, they're called by all sorts of different names. In English, we call them pink dolphins because sometimes they're kind of pink, but in Peru, they sometimes call them bufeos. And anybody here, and you can feel free to type into the like chat bar, anybody know what feo means in Spanish? And I'm not seeing anybody, oh, one person in the chat. Yes, ugly. <laughs> and they go and they come up and take a breath of air. They go, boof. And so they're bufeos. And as you see, as we go through, you might say, yeah, they're kind of ugly, but they're kind of ugly in a cute way. Um, 
anyway, in Brazil, they refer to them as the bodo. And so that's a picture of one coming out of the water. They usually don't come much more than that out of the water, and we'll explain why in a bit. There's a second species of dolphin that lives in the Amazon River Basin, and that is Sotalia right here, or also known as like the gray river dolphin or the Takushi, um, either way. But they're a lot, about mm, half to one third the size of the pink river dolphin. And the pink river dolphin, we often see them in very, very shallow water. Um, and so they have a more wide distribution than the gray river dolphin because they tend to stay in the deeper main channels of the river, like you see right there. So again, the pink river dolphin has a very wide distribution because they can go through all these small tributaries and they do very well in shallow water. They do not do well in deep water at all. And then the gray river dolphin is more limited in its reach because they have to stay in the deep water. So here's a couple of pictures. On the top left is a pink river dolphin and on the bottom right is a bottlenose dolphin. So my question to you guys, and I'm gonna pull up the chat, what can you tell us is different between the river dolphin and the bottlenose dolphin? Anybody wanna put a, an idea of what you see that's different? That's right. So one person put the, Kathy, Kathy put the dorsal fin. So a bottlenose dolphin, and most dolphins have a nice big fin on their back, but in the same area of a pink river dolphin, it's just kind of like a hump. Any other differences that you might be able to see? Just looking at those two pictures. This is very interactive tonight. Can anybody see the colors? There you go, color, nice. Nice, Nancy. Okay, so yeah, the pink river dolphin is pink and in general, a bottlenose dolphin is gonna look gray. So let's go back to the dorsal fin. If you compare the speed that a pink river dolphin swims to that of a bottlenose dolphin, the pink river dolphin is much slower, anywhere between half as slow, or you might say the bottlenose dolphin is twice as fast to three times as fast in speed. So my, a big, big difference right there is speed. And because that dorsal fin on the bottlenose dolphin serves to keep the animal upright so they don't roll as and pitch as they swim through the water. But since the river dolphin doesn't swim that fast, they don't need that dorsal fin. And this is just an aside. The dolphin always seems to be smiling, but you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. Do you think dolphins are always happy, even though they got that nice little smile right there? Everybody's like, I don't want to say anything because Marie tricks us, right? <laughs> right, no way. Everybody gets upset sometimes, but that smile actually has a function. So form and function in biology. If you look, it comes around this way. And if you look closely, there is no water going over the eye. And so that helps channel the water to help protect the eye as they swim through the water. So just a little aside. Um, since most dolphins have a nice pronounced dorsal fin, you can take photos of them. Now when they're born, it's nice and smooth, but as they get older, you know, we all get little cuts and scrapes and scratches and such. And so you can measure the distance between the distant, different notches. And no matter how big that dorsal fin is in the photograph, computer software can measure that as a ratio. And that ratio is the same. And then the dolphin can be individually identified by sight by its dorsal fin. And so most of the dolphins, bottlenose dolphins that is, around the world along the coastlines have been individually identified using their dorsal fins. So here's a bottlenose dolphin and he's at Dolphin Research Center. Notice the color of his back and notice the color of his belly. And there is a reason for that. So up to the chat. So why would, whoops, I just messed up my chat. Why would his colors be different with the back versus the belly? And I know a lot of you probably already know this, but let's see what you come up with. Everybody's like, I don't want to type. Predation, that's right. So they want to avoid predators. Now, there's not too many predators that a bottlenose dolphin has 
Although this guy, as a baby, he had a close encounter with a shark. And you can see he's got a shark bite right there. He's missing part of his dorsal fin, part of a pectoral fin, part of his tail. He was rescued from um, the St. John's River up here by Jacksonville, Florida. And so his name is Jax and he's doing great now. That photo is eight years old. And so he's probably like 11, 12 years old now. But normally if a predator looks down at the back, the back matches the dark bottom of the ocean. And if the predator looks up at the belly, that belly matches the bright color of the sky. And so we call that counter shading. But there's another reason to have counter shading and that is to help the dolphin be a good predator so they can sneak up on their prey. So anyway, the Amazon, if you've been there, you may have noticed is very murky. It's got a lot of sediment in there. So Neil were there, he just scooped up a bottle of water and that's what it looked like. And if you stick your hand under the water, you can't see it at all. Um, counter shading, correct. So here is some drone video that we have. And this is our research boat right here in the middle. And I'm gonna go ahead and play it. And you're gonna see, you can't even see these dolphins, boom, until they break the surface of the water. So when the water is this murky, it doesn't really matter if you have counter shading or not, because nobody, whether you're a fish or a dolphin, can see anything anyways. And this is just typical Amazon water. There was another dolphin right there. If we kind of, oh, there's a couple right there. If I scroll towards the end, there's going to be a triplet of dolphins that surface right up over here. So there they are. So this uh, video was taken near where the Napo River dumps into the Amazon, so at that confluence. And whenever we like record our dolphins, it looks like our boat's not moving, but we're actually drifting down the river and the dolphins just circle our boat and they follow us. Um, don't know why, but they do. So this goes back to evolution. Everybody, you know, I'm assuming, as you are like most of you are probably educators, um, evolution of course is driven by natural selection. Those that have the better characteristics or traits that are suited to their environment are gonna make more babies and those babies are gonna have babies. But evolution can also be driven by the release from natural selection. So this is a type of fish found in Mexico here in pictures A and C and five different occasions, they have moved into caves and started residing in caves. And on five different occasions, the fish lost their eyes and became blind cave fish. So if a fish is mutated and born without an eye, the fish with the eye doesn't have any kind of evolutionary advantage over the blind fish because in a cave, you can't see anything. Anyways, there's no light. So similarly, if you are a dolphin living in brown murky water, if you are born without producing pigmentation, it doesn't matter because you're just gonna, nobody, you're, you're not gonna have any other advantage. Now, if you look right here where you've got two colors of water, this is where one river is dumping into another. And English is crazy and it's not my fault, but what we call this water right here that you can kind of see through, we call it black water. And then the water that you can't see through, in English, we call it white water. And I don't know why, but that's how it is. But what's interesting is dolphins that are endemic or from areas of black water, they do retain coloration into their adult life. So this dolphin is at the Quistacocha Zoo in Iquitos, and he is gray in color. He's about 11 years old in this photo and he retained pigmentation. But this dolphin is, must have come from the areas of white water where it's opaque because he's definitely lost some of that pink coloration. So here's a mother and a calf and they are darker in color and they are also in the black water. Whereas this one is probably endemic to an area where there was more of the white water and not being able to see. And so sometimes you'll find both ecotypes together in the same area. And Brian Griffiths took this photo. He's actually online, I saw him. Um, and this is just a right after a dolphin was being born. And so the babies are born dark gray. 
And then as they age, they lose that pigmentation and they may appear pinker. It's kind of like beluga whales. Beluga whale babies are born darker. And as they age, they lose coloration just like we would in our hair. And so the um, river dolphins do the same thing. Now, this is another picture of the gray river dolphin, but notice what color his tummy is. His tummy in this case is no longer white, it is. And if you guys wanna even unmute yourself and just chime in, go ahead. Cause sometimes typing is tedious. Pink. Notice his tummy. Pink, Pink right. What's he doing? Um, purposing. <laughs> yeah, he's porpoising, jumping, he's coming out of the water. Do you think that takes a lot of energy? Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. yeah, that does. Here's another one. This is Pax. He's a bottlenose dolphin and he's catching this ball and definitely a bright pink colored belly. So just like you, when you exercise, your face will flush red your blood vessels dilate and get close to the surface of the skin to help get rid of heat. And that's also what happens not only with bottlenose dolphins and gray dolphins, but also with the Amazon river dolphins. Hence, they have that pink colored skin. Now, this is an Amazon river dolphin at the zoo in, at the Duisburg Zoo in Germany. And this was actually taken in, it was winter. It was still winter there. Um, a couple of years ago, I took this photo. Um, he's white, but anyway, here is on the lower side, a Chinese river dolphin. What's different? Fin. Yeah, the dorsal fins are a little bit different. What about the size of these fins right here? Who has bigger fins? Top or bottom? the Amazon one does. Yeah, he definitely has much larger fins. Now, these two dolphins have what we say convergent evolution, where they come from different ancestral lines and they've come to look alike because they live in similar habitats. So since they're both in rivers, um, they've, they've evolved these very long rostrums or mouth or jaws, which I'm going to come back to that. But um, here is our Amazon river dolphin. And then we, we've got the Chinese river dolphin. And so anyway, there's a reason of course to have long fins versus short fins. Now this is the tail of a bottlenose dolphin and you can see a little line running along each edge of that, like right down kind of the middle of those tails of those flukes. And that is a major blood vessel. Now, dolphins and whales are designed, well, they're evolved to like conserve heat because water will whisk away your body temperature much faster than air. And so what they have in their flippers is what we call a countercurrent heat exchange. So as the warm body temperature or the core temperature of the animal, as that blood comes out of that body into the fin, it loses heat, but it always has a little bit warmer temperatures than on the returning flow so that some of that heat is transferred to the veins returning to the body. And so this is what happens with the bottlenose dolphin right here. So this is one of the major arteries right here where you can take blood samples from and that's designed to help them conserve heat. This is a pink river dolphin and sometimes we'll see them floating and they'll stick their fin in that pectoral fin which is the one on their side into the water and then float with it up in the air and they'll be bright pink every time. And I think the water is just evaporating off that flipper, allowing them to essentially sweat and helps keep their body cool. So that is one way that they remain cool. So again, the Chinese river dolphin has very small flippers and the Amazon river dolphin, very large flippers. But if you look at where the Chinese river dolphin ranges right here through the Yangtze River. And look, we now all know where Wuhan is. We've learned all about that in the past couple of years, but they, they are in a much higher latitude than at the equator. The Amazon is essentially at the equator. So this is a cold river system. The Amazon is a warm river system. And so the Chinese river dolphin wants to conserve heat. It has smaller flippers or 
you can almost think of the flipper as like a radiator on a car with a large surface area to help get rid of heat. There we go. Okay. Upper side, we have an Amazon river dolphin. On the lower picture, we have a bottlenose dolphin. What is different? Which one's cuter? <laughs> That's so subjective. Can you notice the foreheads? They got a lumpy forehead. He's got a long mouth. He's got a short mouth. And you can't really see it in this picture, but I'll blow it up. And now you can see he's got hair. He's got whiskers on both the top and the lower jaws. Oh, excellent. People are now typing in rostrum heads. The, yeah, and they're lumpy. They're asymmetrical. They're like kind of weird. Again, bottomless dolphin, river dolphin. And here's some more pictures. These guys are not deformed. These are normal dolphins. So I like to say they're twisted, right? Twisted. Of course, the more scientific term is asymmetrical, but it is a lot more fun to say twisted. Yeah, and we're gonna get to this whole thing of why their jaws are shaped that way in just a moment. If you look inside of the their skull, you'll see one side is a little bit larger than the other, which that'll also give rise to that lobby looking forehead. And then the fatty tissue that makes those big bumps is actually right in front of the skull. So this is the part that makes their forehead lumpy. Um, but anyway, this is a graphic um, that shows how they use their echolocation. So it's actually produced with these little air sacs right here that are connected to the blowhole. And they have these little things called phonic lips or monkey lips that vibrate on the air sacs, which produce sound. And then they, the sound travels through the water. And then when it reflects, it comes back through the lower jaw, transferred to the ear or the inner ear, where somehow they get an image of what that object is. So I think this is just kind of cool. This is a little graphic found on Wikimedia that shows echolocation working. Okay, cool. So here is my hypothesis as to why they have a twisted jaw. If you were to look at the skull of an owl, they have offset ears. One's a little higher than the other. And remember, they hear through that lower jaw. So if they have twisted jaws, then that probably would increase the amount of time for that sound to get back to one ear versus the other to help them find their prey, which is incredibly helpful since they live in an environment where they can't see a thing. And again, owls hunt at night, and yes, they have good eyesight, but they also have very good hearing. So they also live in a visually impaired environment. And so it kind of makes sense to me that maybe that long twisted jaw serves to help um, find their prey. And again, there's that asymmetrical skull. Okay, another unique thing about uh, pink river dolphins is they can touch their tail to their mouth. How many of you can touch your toe to your mouth? Probably not too many of us. Um, and this is because their vertebrae are not fused together and that's perfectly uh, normal and natural for them. So here's a picture of the dolphin at the Duisburg Zoo. I went there and I recorded him. That's our array in the water. And notice he can kind of snake through the water and make himself like a little S. Um, and this is incredibly uh, helpful for them. But one of the costs is they can't swim fast and they can't jump high. So again, this is the bottlenose dolphin, but their bones are all along their spine are fused together along with their neck. So it's kind of like I can, I don't know how well you can see this, I can throw this pin pretty far and it goes well, right? But if this was a river dolphin, the pen would be like a bottlenose dolphin and this cord would be like a river dolphin. It, it's just, it's all squishy. So the river dolphins have sacrificed speed and the ability to jump for the ability to maneuver. And this is incredibly helpful for them. And David Bonner, who's online, he took this photograph right here. And my question to people is, how many dolphins do you see? Normally, I would have said two, right? But 
you guys are probably already picking up on it that I like to trick people. And the true answer is um, just one. And so this picture is also by David Bonnet. And in the Amazon, the water levels vary each year um, to being about 11 to 15 meters in difference. So that, that's like you're looking at 30 to 45 feet. So one part of the year, the water is gonna be 45 feet higher than other part of the year when it's gonna be 45 feet lower. When that water is high, those dolphins are gonna follow their food. Now, do you think the fish are gonna stick around in the main channel or are they gonna seek cover among the trees? What do you guys think? Whoops. We got one. Yes, that's right. They're going to go to the trees, fish like structure. And so the dolphins are going to swim in the trees after them. I have actually been in the trees in a boat and had a dolphin surface that I didn't know he was there and scared the bejesus out of me. Um, so David Bonnet was right here recording in March. I think the year was 2014. And then I came to the exact same location in August of that same year. These are images from Google Earth. And notice how much lower the water is. So when he was there, the fish and the dolphins all went in among the trees. And sometimes they were out in the main channels. But when I was there, they were always in the main channels, which is also why a lot of times I have a hard time getting just a single dolphin recorded or just two. Um, much easier to do when the water's high. And now here's an interesting photo. It's kind of one of those search an image. And so I'm gonna put circles around it. Right here on this upper image in the yellow circle, there's a vertebrae, a backbone and a rib. And down here is another backbone. These are from an Amazon river dolphin that has swam into the forest when it was flooded. So there's the channel over there, swam in the forest. And not that it got stuck and died, it just died. I mean, half the year the forest is flooded and then its skeleton resided there and then decomposed and we found it later. This is a picture from the Pacaya Samiria, um, Samiria uh, Reserve, which is kind of the opposite direction. Um, it's upriver from where we go with the Educator Academy. Okay, so this is the Chinese river dolphin right here. This guy went, it was officially listed as extinct in 2006. We knew it was going, its population was declining. We just didn't get around to conserving them and saving them. There's been an unofficial like sighting of one in 2017, but again, it has not been confirmed. Um, so anyway, a problem with the Amazon river dolphins is we don't know how many there are, but because of this practice that has started just relatively recently where they people will kill them to use them as bait. And then they put the bait in these little fish traps right here to catch the fish that you see on the right hand side of the screen. And then they export those fish to other countries. So it's a way of making, making a profit. Um, and they're killing them at a rate in like one area of Brazil, they killed an, an estimated 1,650 in one season which is estimated to be three times faster than the dolphin can actually produce babies. So it's very unsustainable. And because of this practice and because it is spreading, as well as these other threats to them, which we could talk about, but for the time being, I'm just going to skip over them. But if you have questions about them, ask me later. Um, for the time being, they, they with the with this practice, they've been listed as an endangered species as of June in 2018. So not quite four years now. And you can get this information from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature website. And this is the Amazon river dolphin endangered. The gray river dolphin or the Takushi, it is, um, oh, they've listed this guy as endangered now too. It was data deficient. Uh, and I just now noticed that, okay. Um, and that was just updated a couple of years ago. So um, the Sotalia doesn't have as much protection. 
Now, it's not because we haven't tried to visually count them. There was one, there was one study where they did boat travels and they tried to count them once that they could see. And they had three expert observers at the front of the boat and two experts at the back. And even still, 24% of the dolphins were spotted by the people on the back that were not spotted by the people in the front. It is not a, an efficient way to count the number of dolphins. And so even at the end of this study, when they did approximately, uh, for those of you that prefer miles, 1,700 miles, they only counted 2,100 river dolphins. And remember in one area in Brazil, they took almost 1,700 to use as bait in one year. So this is a problem and we'd kind of like to see this problem addressed, but it can't be by us. It's going to have to be by the people that live there. Now, we do know that with the World Wildlife Fund helps support a project where they put satellite tags on some Amazon river dolphins in 2018. However, I think COVID messed that study up because I went online recently looking and I still can't find an update to that study. I don't know what the results were. So the bottom line is it's hard to see these guys because of their shape. And that picture right there you see is a good picture. It's also hard to find them because they don't come out of the water very far. And again, that's a good picture, believe it or not. So we think it definitely needs protection and we kind of want to know how many there are and perhaps listening for them would be a better way to count them than trying to find them. And so that's our question. And that's kind of what we're after is trying to count these dolphins. And again, we're going to use their echolocation clicks because they produce these sounds almost continuously, whereas the other sounds people are interested in, um, like the whistles and stuff, they don't happen as often. And I put this graphic in to show you the blowhole of a bottlenose dolphin. So as that air comes in, these little red things represent the parts that vibrate on the sac. So the ones on the front of the head vibrate on this big blue area. And the ones on the back of this little passageway vibrate on the back part of the bursa right there. And then those produce the clicks that you see. And again, there's that funky head. This picture in to show one, there are no teeth at the front of a dolphin's mouth. Again, this is a bottomless dolphin, not a river dolphin. And I don't know how I put that green line on there, I apologize. But also that the mouth is actually closed. So when they swallow a fish, the fish just goes right down that throat first. And the mouth is connected to the first of their four stomachs. But the blowhole is connected not to their stomachs at all, but it's an individual passage that goes straight to their lungs. On a bottlenose dolphin, that little tiny dot right there, that is all that's left of an external ear. But notice this dolphin listening to a recorder. She's got her ear out of the water, her head's bent a little bit, but also her jaw is out of the water too. And remember, they can hear through that lower jaw. So even without having vision, they can see and navigate. So this is a video of Jax, that dolphin you saw earlier, echolocating in the water. And you may. Now, I don't know if you could hear the buzzing. It's really, really faint. But that buzzing is his echolocation. So even though they have eyes and they can see, they buzz all the time. Okay. So here's a couple of river dolphins. This picture was taken by Cedric Gilman. I don't have my photo credit on there. It's coming. Um, but anyway, we're looking at a couple of parameters of sound. And when people see this, they get all freaked out. Frequency, I don't know what that is. Amplitude, I don't know what that is. But if you break it down into simple terms, everyday terms, frequency isn't all that hard to understand. So frequency is just how often something happens. Today is Thursday. There are roughly how many Thursdays in a year? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Whoops. How many Thursdays in a year? 
We got somebody answered. 52. Ding, ding, ding. Awesome. How often do you have a birthday each year? Birthdays? Jennifer also got 52 Thursdays. Once. Bingo. So there you go. Which has the higher frequency, Thursday or birthday? Which happens more often? Thursdays, right. So Thursday has the higher frequency. When we're looking at sound, it's the same way, but we're just measuring the how often the pressure changes in the air because sound is just energy traveling through air and the air molecules bump each other and we get sound. In general, high frequency is associated with high pitches and low frequency with low pitches. There we go. Amplitude also isn't a hard concept. So a guitar amplifier makes the sound louder. So something with a low amplitude or low energy is very hard to hear. So whispering is low amplitude and yelling is high amplitude. It has more energy. Pretty easy to understand. Two concepts that freak people out, but they're really not hard at all. And then the final thing that we look at is timing because there could be thousands of a second um, between a couple of clicks, but most clicks are consisting, are made up of more than one pulse. Because remember, they got those two little air sacs that they're vibrating. And so between these two pulses is uh, take a, a second and break it into millionths. So millionths of a second. And some people have a hard time with big numbers. So I kind of, well, I broke it down into a, a, a way to understand. So if you take 16 pennies and stack them up and lay them over, that's one inch of pennies. I am 1,000 pennies tall, right on the spot. So was Princess Leia. A million pennies is almost a mile. And just to put it in perspective, right, uh, a billion pennies would go from Orlando to Philadelphia on Google Maps, right, around the river and up and over the mountains. And a trillion pennies would go around the Earth's equator almost 40 times. So, but we only deal with like thousands and millions with our dolphin research. So this shows you a picture of the human hearing range. At the bottom of our graph is time. So this is in milliseconds. And frequency is on the up and down here, the vertical axis right here. And the most a person can hear is 20 kilohertz, right? That's, that's maximum. And probably nobody on this Zoom party tonight can hear 20 kilohertz. Traditionally, dolphins and whales have been recorded taking 96,000 sound samples per second, meaning, and then I'm not gonna go into the science of this, but we can use roughly half of that. And so a dolphin click, we would only get the very bottom portion of it right here at 48 kilohertz. And humans, we probably can't hear any of that because it is above our hearing range. With the equipment that we've been using, we can take a million sound samples per second and we're getting 500 kilohertz of signal. Most of that energy is below 200, but there's definitely some energy above that. And so for the longest time, people didn't think the Amazon River dolphins produced any sound at all. Because if you put a microphone in the water, it would sound like this. Now it's really hard to hear. All you're really gonna hear is water noise going past the microphone in the water. Okay, and that's not a bearded seal call. I don't know why that keeps popping up. Here's that same recording slowed down. And by slowing it down, that puts that frequency into the human hearing range. And you might have heard, although it's faint because we tested it before this, this, again, this Zoom, I call these Zoom parties, but it should sound like a pen clicking, if you will. So 
another sound that we have recorded, whoops, is this one right here. You should be able to hear this one. It's much louder. So here we go. Cool. So I'll open that up for discussion. You can either speak it out or say what you think. Um, what did that sound like to you? Does that sound like anything you would know? Popcorn. Popcorn in the microwave. <laughs> Okay, cool. This is what that sounds like slowed down. And I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you should have been able to hear the clicks in there as well. What did that sound like to you folks? Whoops, I didn't mean to stop sharing. There we go. We've got, and yes, I can share those definitely later um, so that you guys can hear it. Scared your dog. Sorry about that. My dog's used to me doing weird stuff. To me, it kind of sounds like an explosion. Um, and when we hear it, this is a picture that David Bonnet took also, and he recorded that recording at the same time as you see these dolphins here, they were actually chasing fish into that floating vegetation. And here's another comment. Okay, cool. So here is oops, my hypothesis right here. So this is the dolphin at and they eat him live trout and he just caught one right there and in a moment at the end of the video you'll see the bucket where I put the live trout in there so he eats a couple of times a day and they feed him live trout and there we go and i told them that when they fed him i recorded that loud popcorn sound and when you slow it down it sounds like an explosion and i said to them i said i think what they are doing is they're stunning the fish with sound and they go no kidding they had always wondered why because when they put the fish in the water the fish goes limp and then he scoops up and eats the fish um i wish i could have gone back to record him again because that was in 2018 when i recorded him and then we i was supposed to go back in 2020 and then we had covid and then he was a really, really old dolphin. He, in general, in the wild, they lived to be about 30 years old. And he was like just under 50. I think he was like 40 and at least 49 years old when he passed away. Um, so I've lost that opportunity. And there aren't any others um, in human care where I can actually do that. But at least that does show some evidence. There hasn't been evidence of other dolphins doing that. And my question to you would then be, would it make sense that a dolphin could, a river dolphin specifically, could stun fish using sound? Would it be a benefit to a dolphin that can't swim fast and is trying to get fish out of a flooded forest? Yeah, I think so. Totally think, think so. Because they can't swim fast between the trees. They can't they just, they just can't, so they got to stun those fish and then they can swim by and scoop them up. Um, so that's another hypothesis of mine. We have recorded a couple of other strange, um, unique sounds. These don't happen as often. So listen closely, it doesn't last long. Okay, make sure that, again, I'll do it again. But if you slow it down, it sounds like this. I don't know if you could hear that. I hope you could. But once it's slowed down, you can hear the clicks. And to me, it sounded like a whale, um, a big baleen whale calling. Um, another sound is a squeal that we sometimes hear. Whoops. Here, let's play it real time first. Uh-oh. 
okay, that's actually slowed down. So I don't have them linked correctly. Um, and that's the exact same sound. That's when it sounds a little slow and you can hear the clicks as well. So what we use to record them, we have a partner that works in, in at the University of Toulon in France and he's helped make this board right here. He calls it Jason and it's not commercially available, but it's got places to connect five different microphones and each microphone can take a million sound samples per second. We can increase the amplitude and so forth. And then it gets um, recorded into a computer. We use more than one microphone because the speed of sound is fixed in water. So if a dolphin is under our boat, like in this little schematic right here, when it produces a click, it'll reach one of the hydrophones before it reaches the other. And then we can kind of estimate where that dolphin is in relation to our boat. So we call that the time delay of arrival. And this is a plot using four different hydrophones. And if you look at it, which hydrophone do you think that click reached first? I'm gonna open this up for more participation. There we go, we got somebody. Absolutely. So it reached hydrophone three first, it looks like. We got more participation, yay, three. And then I'm gonna say one, no, three, then four, then one, then two. And then our signal analyst, Jerry, he likes to, um, he writes code to try to estimate where these dolphins are. And so this is the result of some of um, Jerry's work right here, Jerry Blakefield. And out of one of the recordings, we saw that there was, most of the clicks were coming from one of the dolphins and other clicks were coming from a second dolphin. And so we were able to determine how many dolphins were in that actual recording. And of course the speed of sound in water is almost five times faster than it is in air, but that's because the molecules are closer together. Okay. This is kind of what our boat looks like when we are set up on the river with some cameras, some hydrophones, um, our boat driver, there's the computer magician from uh, Tulum and, uh, and one of his colleagues right here uh, from also from France, he's a mathematician and there's Dave Bonnet and we're all collecting data trying to see how many dolphins there are and so forth. Our students um, he developed this dolphin tracker. Um, well, you call it an application for a tablet. So we can mark about where they are and the direction that they're traveling and their coloration and such. And that changes us from having to write things out like that. And we can just download it straight into a spreadsheet. So that thing has just been a, a wonderful savior. I love that thing. Um, we also sometimes use side scan imaging, so underwater sonar that sends out a couple of sound beams, so at high frequencies. And yeah, if it's above the beam, you won't see a shadow. If it's below the beam, you will. So this represents the water column on top of that dirt. And on the left, this clearer part right here is the water column on top of that dirt. And the first time, so it looks like that. So the first time that I actually use this system, uh, there's the dolphin in the water column and that is the acoustic shadow it produced. It was crazy. So here you can see like probably a mother and calf, another mother and calf and another one. These are higher up in the water. This one's lower, so it's got a shadow. That one's turning probably to look at our equipment underwater and the water is only not quite 18 feet deep in this location because Again, the dolphins like the shallow water. Now, just in case you were wondering how to tell a boy from a girl, with pink dolphins, the males can be on average about a half meter, which is only about that far, um, a foot and a half longer than females. But the only way to truly tell a male from a female is if you flip them over and the males have one long line and inside that slit are the male reproductive organs tucked inside to prevent drag. Then there's a smaller line underneath, which is the anal area and that takes care of that business. Females on the other hand have one long line inside of their female reproductive organs and the anal area together. And then on either side are smaller slits that 
is where the mammary glands are located or where the milk, where the milk comes from. Males exclamation points, females division signs. And without me highlighting it, that's what they look like. So this is a picture right here, male or female. You got one long line and one smaller. So it's definitely male and that's a gray river dolphin. They nurse or take milk for about a year and to drink milk underwater is totally challenging. This is one of the reasons I pointed out they don't have teeth up front because the babies, they don't have lips. So they roll their tongues up into little straws, kind of like you see this guy doing right here. And then there are fringes on either side of the tongue that lock together to make a straw. Then they insert that into the mammary gland of the mother and the mother squirts milk. And so what have we found? Just like light can reflect off of surfaces, sound can reflect off of surfaces as well. And we've noticed our clicks seem to have two components, one that is like an inverse of the other. So where one goes up, the other one goes down, sort of like a reflection. But if you look closely, this one has more energy than the first one. So in general, when things reflect, they don't have a greater energy. Plus the time delay between the first pulse and that pulse right there is not sufficient for it to travel to the surface of the water and then back to our hydrophones. So we, there's some evidence to suggest that these inverted pulses can help the dolphins navigate murky environments like you see right here. This was modeled by a researcher um, in the UK where he was actually studying radar, but he's interested in dolphins too. And he put a fish target in a cloud of like 35 million bubbles. And then he sent out pulses that were identical and inverted pulses. And when he did the twin inverted pulses, he was able to detect the fish in that cloud much better than if the pulses were identical. So this, is good evidence that there is an evolutionary pressure for the dolphins to produce inverted pulses in order to navigate their world better. And a large majority of our pulses show this. And again, this may be the reason why they have asymmetrical heads. These pulses, because they have different frequencies from the first pulse to the second, we think they might frequency modulate or change it. In other words, start with a slow, then high within one click. And then the next dolphin would go high, then low. So it might be a contact call, like a way to keep track of your kid, like mom, baby, mom, baby. Very helpful if you can't see your kid. So kids should be heard, not seen. I don't know if you guys agree with that, <laughs> especially the teachers. <laughs> There we go. Um, and this kind of shows you that the frequency is changing within a click. We've also got higher frequencies than previously recorded due to our equipment. And even if the dolphin can't hear it, it doesn't matter. That's still information we could use to possibly be able to identify each individual dolphin. So using the frequencies and those twin inverted pulses. And I'm getting a little short on time. Um, Krista, do you want me to keep going or because I'm kind of going off a little bit right here, although this is totally interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think let's open it up for some questions. Um, see if anybody has, we can try to honor the, the hour time commitment. If you want to hang yeah. on, you're willing to hang on, that's great. But um, if anybody has questions right now that the burning questions, throw them in the chat real quick um, or by all means, unmute, raise your hand, um, go for it. Um, and then, Marie, if you, you can wrap up with the, the rest of your slides if we don't get any questions. Sure. Silence. There's a question or a comment or something. Yeah, from Brian. Is sexual selection in dolphins? And so that's where this was going. <laughs> um, sexual selection means like there's something in the environment that would cause a dolphin to, or in any species for that matter, to be the males to be different than the females. And so that's actually where this is going right here. So here's a dolphin tossing something. And I usually, when I do this with people, but it's much harder to do this online with in a Zoom party, is I usually ask people like, 
what do you think it's doing? And most people say, oh, well, look, they've got objects, they're playing. But what I then challenge people to do is say, well, what color is it? And they all say, well, they're pink. And then I go back and I ask you, but what color are the babies? The babies are gray. Whenever we see them playing with objects, they're never gray. It's never the kids, it's always the adults. And every time we see them messing with objects, they start beating each other up. They start jumping on each other, whacking each other with their tails. And it tends to be the males. So the hypothesis I will put forward is that those objects are like the antlers, or in this case, I like to call it the rack on that elk right there. Um, oh, and the three gorge, let me come back to the three gorges dam and then I will answer that question. Um, I will tie this to the narwhals the, and that horn on the narwhal, that's actually their teeth um, growing out of the skull. And it's about, it's bigger than a person. So it's about two meters, six feet long. And it's the males that have the tusk, not the females. And they do sword fight with them. Um, and I propose that that is also a secondary male characteristic so that you can, you know, tell them apart. And analogous to the horns. And if you look at this evolutionary tree right here and you look at dolphins and whales, their closest living land relative is the hippo. And then the next one are animals with hooves, such as the pronghorn sheep. And then I would like to remind you again that like a cow has four stomachs, a dolphin has multiple chambered stomachs. Um, they also have the same bones in your hands and your, you know, like your radius ulna and humerus bones. They have all of those as well as vestigial or non or leg bones that they don't use anymore. This just came out this week, um, an article in the New York Times, and this will be a peer reviewed paper once they get to that point. But they caught six dolphins and they know at least a couple of them were males because they're male organs were also shown as they were quote unquote playing with this anaconda right here. I once again will say that that is a secondary male characteristic um, and sexual selection. And again, they saw the males doing it. So probably a way like just like the big horn sheep bash their heads together in order to like then decide who gets to mate with the females. I think it's similar except they use objects because if you have a big rack you know big antlers it's going to make it hard to swim through the water so why not use objects um and those were some more pictures of that back to the gorgeous dam not just dam. so the dams both in the amazon and in the yangtze river do prevent fish from getting side to side and dolphins from crossing side to side to find their mates. In China, another problem that they faced was they used these like circular fish hooks to catch fish and the dolphins would get caught on those. And then unfortunately, like they would lose their life because again, they're mammals, they gotta come up and get a breath of air. Um, some of the other pressures facing the dolphins in the Amazon is kind of like Chinese folk medicine. Some people believe carrying around the genitals of an Amazon river dolphin is good luck and will bring you boyfriends or human girlfriends. And if you go to the markets, you can actually find these things, even though it's illegal, you can find these things for sale. Um, so dams are a problem. Logging is a problem, excessive logging, because that adds more sediment to the water, which then adds more nutrient pollution. Um, and then you just get a cascade of negative events that follow that. People where we're at in the Amazon tend to respect the river dolphins. They fear them because they believe the dolphins can change shape into people and that they come steal people's souls or even impregnate girls. Um, so, and even, in, and I don't, it's a, it's a belief I don't want to change, kind of like that. Um, and I think it would be super interesting to collect their legends about animals in the river, not just the dolphins, but things in general. Um, a 
dream of mine somehow would be someday to go down and spend a lot of time with them and help the people like collect data on the fish that they're catching to eat, along with do they spot dolphins and areas where there's not dolphins to see if there's not the fish they like to eat, to see if there's a trophic cascade. And if we can show that and let those people see that for themselves, then they would be more willing to protect the river dolphins in their habitat. So anyway, did that answer the question about the dam? I kind of went way off there. Cool. Yeah, I think so. Other questions, everybody? Thanks, Marie. This is, um, as always, been very informative and it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff, especially to get this inside look. So appreciate that. Um, anybody else have questions? What are we going back, Marie? <laughs> I was hoping this summer, but I'm not so sure. It's like the airline tickets are so expensive right now. So we shall see. Yeah, we're when at, are you going back? <laughs> yeah, Morpho's heading back this summer for, for two programs in July. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll we'll run across uh, David and and some other folks while we're down there, and then we'll get Marie back down there hopefully next summer. Okay, another question. Can you elaborate on trophic cascade? Trophic cascade is where you have a top predator, for example, and if you remove it, troph means food. So everything down the food chain from there changes even to the point of impacting the environment. A classic case would be like the removal of wolves from Yellowstone. Um, our government paid people to kill them and there was a bounty on each wolf head that you turned in back in like the 1800s because the wolves were eating livestock. But then that caused the deer and the elk populations to explode. They ate all the plants and the trees and then you lost birds, you lost, you, you just lost everything. And then there was more erosion and the rivers changed. With the reintroduction of wolves that has caused a reduction in the deer and then more trees, the growth of trees increased fivefold, five times. And then you got more songbirds and badgers and bears and less erosion. Another example would be like the removal of sea otters. Sea otters eat sea urchins and sea urchins eat kelp. Otters, now you have an explosion of sea urchins that eat the, just, they can't swim. There are these little balls. Uh, the bottom of these giant kelps that grow 300 feet tall in some places. And then it's like trees, they just fall over and they're gone. Where you had like a forest before with structure and fish and invertebrates. Now there's nothing because you remove, I won't say nothing, you got a bunch of sea urchins and, and brittle stars on the bottom, but it was just the removal of a few sea otters that caused that. So that's another example of trophic cascades. And you can find many, many other examples online. Good question. Maria, I have one comment. I, I really appreciate your, your talk. Uh, uh, what concerns me and has since the start of our work uh, is that there isn't enough emphasis being put on the insults that uh, humans uh, are raining down on these animals, which basically are the canary in the coal mine for, for the Amazon. Uh, there's no predator that we know of that preys on, on uh, the river dolphins uh, except humans. Um, we've, as you pointed out, we've got all kinds of things going on, deforestation. There are 21 dams currently in planning along the entire Amazon River Basin for hydroelectric power. They need that so they can generate fertilizer so they can grow more soybeans and or other uh, protein rich <laughs> crops for humans. So there's comp a competition that's growing. What we've been able to do uh, through efforts of Marie and, and others is to leverage technology to at least hopefully start understanding how we can count the animals so we have a baseline. 
we're not there. Um, it turns out these guys are really, really complex. They're probably as complex in their uh, communications and, and way they use sound as we are as humans with our visual based uh, sense of the environment. So uh, Morpho, you do, you're doing a great job. Uh, my wife is on with you uh, with this uh, talk and, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, personally committed and I think everybody listening hopefully will be personally committed to, to uh, continuing this when we get back down the Amazon post COVID. COVID. So thank you, Marie. Yeah, thank no, you. Thank so you. And thank you to David for all the good work that you've done and the, and the support um, for, for Morpho and the work that we're trying to accomplish. And thanks to Dodges too for, for making this, um, a lot of this work that we do feasible and possible and, and the work that they do to preserve their little piece of the Amazon. So um, if there aren't any other questions, um, or if there are, please do raise your hand, unmute, or, or drop it in the chat. We'll, um, we'll share this recording. Um, we'll send out an email link so that you can have it. Um, I know we had a request for some of the sound recordings. Um, we'll make sure that those become available via the email. Um, again, if you're interested in, in learning more about what Marie is doing or what the Morpho Institute is doing, by all means, check out our website and um, be in touch. Um, we do have a, a newsletter that we send out if you want to know about the upcoming webinars that we're going to do next fall. Um, we'll start in September again. Um, we are going to be down in the Amazon for the better part of July. Um, we are super excited to get back. It's been a long two years of waiting. Um, and we've, we've just got some really amazing folks that are going to join us. And, and next year, 2023, we'll get Marie back down there too. I'm, I'm sure of it. So um, thanks everyone so much for, for tuning in tonight. It's, it's been a pleasure. And Marie, thank you as always. You're just uh, a joy to be with and um, love learning from you. So thanks. Thank you everybody for coming. And if you have questions or anything else, send me a message. Oh, look, there's a dolphin. She's got a pink river dolphin. Oh my God, it's cool. Nancy has one. I yes, don't know if you guys can see it. Refrigerator bag. But I, I hope I meet you one day, Marie, and I haven't yet. So I just want to say hi. Hi, we will, it'll happen. Be patient, it'll happen. I know for sure I'm going, I'm, I'm pretty certain I, I'm, I'll be down there for sure in 2023. Hopefully before then, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens this summer. Okay, sounds uh, good. I see a, a question from Jennifer about getting a PD certificate. Um, we can certainly put together a certificate that says you were on this webinar for an hour. I'm happy to do that. Um, I have your email, Jennifer, so I'll write that down in my notes and, and shoot you an email tomorrow about um, what that might look like, okay? If anybody else needs that, by all means, let me know. I'm happy to, happy to accommodate, so. All right. Thank you, Marie. Um, have a lovely um, May weekend, everybody. I hope the, the sun's coming out and it's getting warming up and uh, the flowers are blooming. And, you know, for all you teachers out there, you're in the home stretch now. Keep going, man. And we're uh, eight weeks out from the Amazon. So we are in countdown mode. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. 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 <laughs>